Praise the Lord. I welcome you to our Bible study this glorious Monday in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for our Bible study. Thank you for your spirit, guiding, leading, teaching us every time. We pray, Lord, that what you teach us today from your word, from the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll imprint on every heart so that, Lord, we will obey you and we will follow your path and we will be ready for the coming of the Lord in Jesus' name. Open our eyes of understanding. Help us, Lord, to remember what we knew before and then what we have not known to teach us and guide us into all truth. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We continue with our study of the gospel according to Mark. And the gospel according to St. Mark uh, leads us now to chapter 13. We'll be studying this chapter for some time. And you know that the Lord is responding to the demand, the question of the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. They wanted to know. They knew that Christ will come again. And they knew that everything he had said will come to pass. But they wanted to know now, what are the signs of your coming? What are the signs of the end of the world? And when will the time be that the temple will be destroyed and demolished? And in the answer of the Lord Jesus Christ, he had been telling them from that time, that is from the time the question was asked, until the very end of time, he had been outlining for them the things that will happen. And now, in all those uh, series of events that will take place, we now come to this today, which calls us to watchfulness and readiness. Tonight, we're looking at Mark chapter 13, and we're studying from verse 24 to verse 37. The topic tonight is saints watchfulness and readiness for Christ's coming. The watchfulness of saints and their readiness for Christ's coming. Let's look at some selected verses of scripture. Uh, that is in this Mark chapter 13. We're looking at verse 24. Please open your Bible with me. It says, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. Then it goes on in verse 25. It says in verse 25, And the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. Then in verse 26, it tells us, And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power, and glory. Then he tells us in verse 27, Then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, that is from the north, the west, and the east, and the south, from all over the world, from the uttermost of the part of the earth, and then it goes on until the uttermost part of heaven. And in verse 28, he tells us, Now learn a parable of the fig tree when her branch is yet tender and put it forth at least ye know that summer is near and then as we learn from that it says in verse 29 so ye in like manner when ye shall see these things come to pass all that he had been talking about about the signs of the end and the signs of his coming when you see those things in quick succession coming to pass, know that it is near, even at the door. And then it says something specific in verse 30, and it says, Verily I say unto you, that this generation shall not pass, that is, the generation that sees all those things happening, all those events happening, all the signs he has given, and all the things uh, we're studying about, when any generation of people, when they see those things coming to pass, and uh, know that uh, it says, this generation shall not pass till all these things shall be done. And then in verse 31, it says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. It's telling us, 
all these things were learning in prophetic understanding. It says they will not pass away. His word will be fulfilled. Let's go to the last verse of the chapter now, which is verse 37. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. What I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. That's why as we look at the study tonight, we're looking at says watchfulness, believers, watchfulness. If you are born again, you are a child of God, and you are waiting for the coming of the Lord, you must be ready. You must keep watching. Saints, watchfulness, and readiness for Christ's coming. We're dividing the message to three parts tonight. Number one, the great unprecedented wonders at Christ's coming. Great unprecedented wonders at Christ's coming. That is, the things that will happen that have never happened before. Wonders, wonders, unprecedented. And they'll be great and observable. Point number two, great undeniable wisdom in Christ's command. He has given us commandment, and that commandment he has given us, there is great wisdom there, undeniable wisdom there, great undeniable wisdom in Christ's command. Point number three, great undiminishing watchfulness. That is, we're watching, and we're not diminishing our watchfulness. We keep on watching, we keep on watching, steadily we're watching, steadfastly we're watching, great undiminishing watchfulness with Christ consecration. We we'll come to point number one now, which is great unprecedented wonders at Christ's coming. And we're reading from verse 24 of that Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13, verse 24. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. In verse 25, it says, and the stars of heaven shall form. And the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. Verse 26 says, And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Then he tells us in verse 27, And then, that is at that time, as they see him coming in great glory and in great power, at that time shall he send his angels and shall gather together his select from the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. The Lord is telling us about the wonders that will take place. The wonders is not the wonder of the healing we're talking about now. It's not the wonder of deliverance we're talking about now. The wonders that will take place in the shaking of the stars, in the shaking of the galaxies of the powers of, of heaven, and the shaking and the shattering of the constellation. And that leads me, as we consider this, we're looking particularly now at verses 24 and 25 the shaking of the shattered constellation. When we talk about constellation, we're talking about the arrangement of all the stars and of all the planets, and everything will be shaking. Even to the very galaxies of the powerful uh, planets, everything will be shaking. That's what Jesus said. He said, but in those days, after that tribulation, you understand, there's going to be the rapture. That's what we are waiting for now. There's going to be the catching away, the translation of the church, of the people of God is going to take us away. After the rapture, there is tribulation. Uh, the tribulation will start with the beginning of sorrows. And then from the middle of that seven-year period, there's going to be the great tribulation. At the end of the great tribulation, Jesus said, and Jesus prophesied, and Jesus predicted, and Jesus declared after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened. After that tribulation, the moon shall not give a light. And then in verse 25, it says, And the stars of heaven shall fall. The stars of heaven shall fall. And the powers that in heaven shall be shaken. As we read that, that may come as a surprise to you. But actually, as you look at the Old Testament, look at Isaiah, for example. There are many passages to refer to. But just a few, Isaiah chapter 13, verse 13, look at prophecy. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. The Lord has said that that's what he will do. And Isaiah prophesied about it. Look at Joel chapter 2. 
and you'll see that these prophets of the Old Testament emphasize the same thing, that everything will be shaken, everything will be shattered. It says in Joel chapter 2, I believe you're opening your Bible, and you're marking these uh, verses in your Bible, in Joel chapter 2 verse 30, and I will show wonders in the heavens. That's why we call this unprecedented wonders, and it's going to happen at the time of the coming of Christ. And I will show wonders in the heavens, and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Look at verse 31. In verse 31, the sun shall be turned into darkness. Exactly what Jesus Christ also said, that this will happen. There will be the shaking, there will be the shattering of the constellation and the galaxies of the powers of the sky. It says the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. And does the New Testament uh, accept that, corroborate that? Look at Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, and we're reading from verse 25. Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 25. It's still saying the same thing. See, that he refused not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth much more, Shall not we escape? Look at this. If we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. He spoke on earth through all those prophets. He spoke on earth through Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. When our Savior was here, but now look at this. He's saying he's speaking from heaven. What's he speaking from heaven? Look at verse 26. It says in verse 26, whose voice they shook the earth. At that time in the past, his voice shook the earth. But now, this is what he's saying from heaven. He has promised, saying yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. That is all the sky, all the firmament, all the stars, the sun and the moon. I'm going to shake everything God said. And then in verse 27, in verse 27 it says, And this word, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things that are shaking. That is when the earth is shaking, it will be shifted out of place. As of the things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. So you understand that as the Lord Jesus Christ has prophesied, as he has predicted, the time is coming and is very near, very near the time of the coming of Christ, that all these things shall be shaken. And then Jesus said in Mark chapter 13, in Mark chapter 13, reading from verse 26, Mark chapter 13, reading from verse 26, is talking now about the sight of the sun coming with great power. It says, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. It says that Christ is coming. And that when he comes, he'll come with great power and glory. Please understand, this is talking about the second coming of Christ. The rapture is taking place already. And then after that, the great tribulation. And after the great tribulation of those days, then the sun will be darkened and the moon also will turn black and everything will be shaking on earth and also in the sky and the stars will fall and then shall they see the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds with great power and glory. Again, we're going to refer back to the Old Testament so that you understand this coming of Christ in great power and glory is something that has been predicted predicted in the Old Testament and Jesus is now affirming it. Look at Daniel chapter 7, reading from verse 13. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, and I, I saw in the night vision, and behold one like the Son of Man. Look at what Daniel is saying. He's saying, I see, you must understand that the Old Testament prophets, they saw Jesus Christ from his birth, Emmanuel, they saw Jesus Christ from his uh, childhood. A child is born. They saw Jesus Christ as the Son of God giving himself for our sins. And then the Son is also given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. They saw the time when he will come back 
to reign. They saw the first coming. They saw the second coming. And now Daniel is saying, I saw in the night visions, behold, one like the Son of Man came on the clouds of heaven. Exactly what Jesus Christ affirmed, that the Son of Man, the Son of God, he will come with clouds, with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. And then in verse 14, it says in verse 14, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages shall serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that shall not be destroyed. It says Christ will come. And when he comes, he'll set up his kingdom. When he comes, he'll set up uh, his uh, rule and his dominion. And it will be forever and ever. Do you remember when Jesus Christ was betrayed? And then he was given to the hands of uh, the Caiaphas and the high priest and all those people to try him. Uh, there's something important in what happened at that time. Look at Matthew chapter 26. In Matthew chapter 26, I believe you're opening your Bible. Matthew chapter 26, I was reading from verse 63. In verse 63, but Jesus held his peace. It was at this time now, like a lamb before his shares, he was dumb and he opened not his mouth. Then the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God. Well, Christ will have to speak now. The Lord Jesus will have to talk now because the high priest said, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. And look at the answer in verse 64. In verse 64, Jesus says unto him, Thou hast said. Nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And before you go away from that verse, look at that verse very well. They were going to kill him. They were going to crucify him. He was going to die. And yet he said, hereafter, after that crucifixion, hereafter, after that uh, burial, hereafter, after rising from the dead, there is uh, assurance that Jesus had in his heart. He knew that this was not going to be the end. He knew that the first coming was not going to be the end. He came to make the sacrifice. He came to redeem us. But then he said, hereafter, after all that has been done, shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. The sight of the sun coming with great power. And then he said something will happen as he comes. He tells us in Revelation uh, chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 is saying that at that time uh, when he comes again, this is the second time now, the second coming, behold, he cometh with clouds. You see, the same thing, the clouds of power, the clouds of glory, the clouds in, in, in their brightness, behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. This is different from the rapture. At the time of the rapture, not every eye will see him. In fact, at the time of the rapture, he will not step on the earth. He will be in the sky. And then he will catch up the saints, the believers, to meet him in the air. And not every eye will see him, only the people that meet him. But now, after the rapture, uh, there will be great tribulation. After that great tribulation, all these things will be happening. And then it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Can you say that with me? Even so, Amen. Now we look at uh, what is going to happen at that time when those eyes, when they see him uh, at his second coming in Mark chapter 13, uh, verse 27. Mark chapter 13, uh, verse 27. He will summon the saints. He will call the saints because he said, and then uh, 
shall you send his angels. And those angels shall gather together his select from the four winds and from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. That is, wherever those elects are, wherever those saints are, wherever those people are that now accept him and believe him, and wherever those people are that will because of him, and they say, even so come, Lord Jesus, this is the second coming now. All those people that believed on him at that time, it says he will get, you send the angels and then he'll gather those saints together. Actually, Matthew tells us the same thing in Matthew chapter 24. Read it from verse 31. Matthew chapter 24. I read him from verse 31. Look at this, open your Bible, please. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his select from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. It will happen. And I pray that when that happens, and when the rapture takes place, even before this time, you'll be ready. And you'll go with the Lord in Jesus' name. And let's go to point number two now. Point number two talks about great, undeniable wisdom in Christ's command. The Lord is giving us a command. And the command is giving us, look at verse 28 of Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13, reading from verse 28. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. It says we should learn. And this is a commandment of the Lord. It doesn't say, well, if you don't understand, just uh, pray and everything will be all right. He said we must learn. Learn a parable of the fig tree. When a branch is shed tender and put it forth leaves, ye know that summer is near. You see, the children of Israel are different climates, different from our climates in Africa. We have dry season and rainy season. They had summer, and they had a winter, and they had spring, and they had autumn. And all those areas, they knew when autumn will come, when winter will come, when summer will come, and when the other, uh, the other conditions of their, of their climate will come. And he says, haven't you noticed, haven't you seen in what happens in your country that when the branches of the fig tree, when they are tender and they are putting forth leaves, then you know that summer is near. It brings a conclusion on that something we're going to learn from that. Look at verse 29. In verse 29, it says, so ye in like manner, when ye shall see these things come to pass, when ye shall see not just the fig tree alone, but all these things that he has outlined from uh, Mark uh, chapter 13, uh, coming from verse 4 all through to this time, when you see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the doors. What's, what's near? What did he say? What did he say is near? It says, the Son of Man coming. The second coming of the Son of Man. It says you will know that that is near even at the doors. Can I tell you something? If you have number one, that must happen before number two. And you have number two, that must happen before number three. And you say that number three is near. Obviously, number one is much nearer. What I'm saying is, number one, the rapture. Number two, the great revelation. Number three, the second coming of the Lord. And Jesus said that number three, the second coming of the Lord, when you see all these things happening, you know that that second coming, number three, is near. If number three is near, number one, the rapture is nearer. That's why, my brother, my sister, you don't have any time to look back. You don't have any time to compromise. You don't have any time uh, to say, I will go away from the Lord and later I will come back. That later may not come to you because number one is much, much nearer. Look at that verse 29 again and note it in your Bible. It says, so ye in like manner. 
when ye shall see these seas come to pass, know that it is near even at the doors. It tells us in verse 30, in verse 30, it says, Verily I say unto you, that this generation shall not pass, the generation that sees all these things coming to pass, this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. In verse 31, he assures us that heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And then he says in verse 32, if we know that his word will not pass away, he says, but of that day and of that hour, knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. And then in verse 33, he says, take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. As we look at this, these verses, Verses 28 to 33 that I've read to you now under the subtitle of Great Undeniable Wisdom in Christ's Command. And let's see what he's telling us. Number one, relearn the parable of his imminent coming. We've learned it before. Learn it again. It says learn and learn and keep on learning. Look at verse 28. It says now learn. Tomorrow, now learn. And if he has not come, if it comes to next week, now learn. And if he has not come that following week, in the following months or following year, now learn. You keep on learning and you keep on watching all these signs that he said will happen. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and put forth leaves, ye know that summer is near. And then in verse 29, it says so, in like manner, when ye shall see, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, even at the doors of Vastachi. We've read it before, but so important. Verily I say unto you that this generation, this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. It's talking about we learn about learning the parable of his imminent coming. When these things happen, no delay anymore, no postponement anymore, no prolonging the time anymore. Age will come. Look at Ezekiel chapter 12, reading from verse 25. Ezekiel, Ezekiel, please open your Bible. Ezekiel chapter 12, and we're reading from verse 25. I'm sure you are there now. Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 25. It says, For I am the Lord, and I will speak. And the word that I shall speak shall come to pass. The Lord is assuring us. You know, he said, I and my father are one. When the father speaks, it's done. When the son speaks, it's done. And the word that he speaks will be fulfilled. That's why he said, I am the Lord. I will speak. And the word that I shall speak shall come to pass. Look at this. It shall no more be prolonged. Once you see all these things coming to pass, and Jesus said, the generation that sees all these things happening you know, will not pass until all these things be done. And he's saying like we have in Ezekiel chapter 12 verse 25, it shall be no more prolonged for in your days, O rebellious house, will I say the word and will perform it, says the Lord God. It says, even if the people say, we don't believe, we don't accept, everything will go on. It says, even if they are rebellious, or rebellious house, I will speak the word, it will be performed. Look at verse 28. In verse 28 of that same chapter, it says, therefore say unto them, thus says the Lord God, there shall none of my words be prolonged anymore. Once we see all the signs that Jesus Christ has given, then we know it's not going to be prolonged anymore. There are people that will say, that's how they say, that's what they say, Christ is coming, Christ is coming, the rapture is going to take place, and uh, you know, they've been saying it all these many years now, and it has not been done, but Jesus said, the generation, 
that sees all these things coming to pass, that generation shall not pass until everything be done. So you cannot say, well, they've been saying it before. It says now, there shall none of my words be prolonged anymore. But the word which I have spoken shall be done, says the Lord God. The words that Jesus Christ has spoken, those words are going to be done. And then we'll come back to Mark chapter 13. Something to remember. Something you ought to remember. Mark chapter 13, reading from verse 31. Mark chapter 13, verse 31. Remember the permanence of this indestructible world. The world will be destroyed. The stars will be shaking. All the galaxies, everything will be shaking. But the world of Christ will not be shaking. And he wants us to remember this all the time. Be conscious of this all the time. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But my word shall not pass away. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. I will read him from verse 8. It says, The grass withereth, and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. The word of our God shall stand forever. Uh, let me remind you once again that God has sent the Lord Jesus Christ and he has said, I put my words in his mouth and he says, hear ye him. We're told in Hebrews that God speak to the fathers by the prophets in days gone by, but now he's speaking to us by his son and now all the words of god given unto jesus that he has spoken to us they will stand forever remember once again heaven and earth shall pass away but christ's words shall not pass away look at zechariah chapter 1 verse 6 zechariah chapter 1 we're reading from verse 6 it says but my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, they did not take hold of your fathers, and they returned and said, like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us, according to our ways, and according to our doings, so as he dealt with us. Like the Lord has said, exactly so is going to do in First Peter chapter 1. Reading from verse 25, First Peter chapter 1, verse 25, But the word of the Lord endureth forever. Did he say if the rapture will take place in my father's house and many mansions? If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. When I go to prepare a place for you, I will come and take you unto myself. The word of the Lord endureth forever. Did he say that all these signs shall happen? The sun will be darkened and the moon will be turned into blood and all the constellation of heaven, everything will be shaking and then will be the son of man, the sign of the son of man coming in the clouds. It says the word of the Lord endureth forever. Did he say that every eye shall see him and it will wail because of him. It will happen. And it says when you see all these things happening, know that he is near even at the doors. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Now, and the Lord told us something very important that you ought to take note of, and it's in Mark chapter 13, reading from verse 32. Mark chapter 13, and we're reading from verse 32. It says in verse 32, But of that day and that hour knoweth no man. Of that day and that hour knoweth no man. Can you stop there for a moment? There are people who are ignorant of what Jesus Christ has said, and the search dates, they, they tell their congregation, they tell their denomination, they tell their followers, they say now they know something that Jesus said nobody knows, but they know it, and they say Christ will come, the rapture will take place at such a particular time, 
and many of those people, because they need to understand they are not reading the word of God, they believe their preachers, they believe their prophets, they believe their pastors. In fact, it happened in uh, some years uh, gone by that a man like that uh, rose up and he said the date and he said a uh, this particular date many years ago, I think 1884, that Christ will come. And you know all their members, all the people that listened to him, uh, they sold their houses, they sold everything they had, and then they wore white uh, garment and they went to stay on a particular mountainside looking up is coming because the prediction has said on that particular day he will come. And he was disappointed. Christ did not come according to the prediction of the presumptuous uh, preachers at that time. Today, too, we ought to watch as we see the pandemic, as we see all things that are happening. There are people on the basis of that, they want to set date and they want to say, We know this is the time Christ will come. Look at your Bible and underline that. It says, But of that day and that hour knoweth no man. There may be an author that will write a book. And then they, they print uh, the book and they put it on the net and it is on ebook, it's everywhere. And they say, now this is the time Christ will come. And they tell you something. They said, when I prophesied that uh, so and so will become president in America, it happened, like I said, when I prophesied that this will happen, this will happen, it happened just like that. And they say they are prophets of international repute. And they have prophesied some things before. Everything happened. Now they are telling their people, those who want to read about them and those who are watching them on the YouTube, they say, this is the time now they have discovered Christ will come. Please remember and reject the presumption of all those unwise, imprudent dead setters. But of that day and that hour, no as no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven. Somebody says an angel appeared to me and he told me this is the date. That's, a, that's an evil angel. That's a falling angel because Jesus said, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, look at that, neither the Son, but the Father. Some people will say, I was praying, and while I was praying, then there was light in the room, and then Jesus Christ appeared unto me and said, My son, my servant, I'm going to tell you now, and go and tell my people, this is the day I will be coming back. It says, neither the Son, but the Father. And then he tells us in verse 33, in verse 33, take ye heed, you must reject that kind of presumption. You must reject the people that are pretending that now they know when Christ will come. Take ye heed, watch and pray. For ye know not when the time is. No prophet knows, no preacher knows, no denomination knows, no date setter actually knows. For ye know not when the time is. It tells us the same thing in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, we're reading from verse 36, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only, my Father only. If the Father has kept him from the Son, has kept him from the angels, has kept him from everyone, not even Paul the Apostle set any date, not Peter, did he set any date? Look at the whole of the New Testament. They say, we which are alive shall be caught up together with them. They didn't know the day when Christ will come, the day of the rapture. Nobody knew and nobody knows. And the day when the great revelation and the point will start, nobody knows. And the day when Christ will come, nobody knows. So that we can be watchful every time. So that we can be ready every time. So we're not a if we know that well is going to come at such and such a date, then we can say, I'll do whatever I need to do now. I don't have to be ready now. It's not coming now. But it says of that day and that hour knoweth no man. No. Not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. In verse 37, it says, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. In verse 38 it says, 
For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Now look at what it says in verse 39. It says, and they knew not. They knew not. Nobody knows. They didn't know at that time when the flood will come. The Lord did not give any date to Noah. He just told him, be very sure, be certain of this. The flood is coming. Build the ark and be busy doing what I told you to do rather than speculating what's the date, what's the hour, what's the time. It says they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Look at verse 42. In verse 42, it says, Watch therefore, because we know not. Watch it therefore, because nobody can predict. Watch thee therefore, watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. For ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. And let's look at Psalm 19, uh, verse 13. Verse 19, verse 13. A prayer you ought to pray. And a prayer you ought to be conscious of every time. Keep back. Thy servant also from presumptuous sin. Setting date, when Christ says, nobody knows. Not even the angels of God in heaven. And not even the Son of Man, but only the Father. If somebody then goes ahead to say, well, Jesus, I know you said nobody knows, but I know. That means that it's accusing Christ of lying, of deception. A Christ says, nobody knows. A person like that that will set a date and write a book and put uh, his message on the YouTube or everywhere and he's saying, I'm announcing to you, this is the day that Christ will come. That's a presumptuous sin. And for you, you ought to pray that you will not be sucked in. You will not believe. You will not accept all the presumptions of those deceivers. And you are praying, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Let not that powerful, presumptuous preacher have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. To be presumptuous is a great transgression. And to be setting date, when Christ says nobody knows the date, it's not just a waste of time, it's a waste of life. It's a waste of resources. And then it's a great transgression. And the Lord will help you to reject all the presumption of those uh, impudent, imprudent, did set us in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three now. And this we'll find in Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13, reading from verse 34. Great on diminishing watchfulness or Christ-like consecration. Look at uh, chapter 13 of Mark. And we're reading from verse uh, reading from verse 34. In verse 34, but the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who led his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work. And to every man his work. And to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. In verse 35, it says in verse 35, watch it therefore, he has given you a work to do. Watch it therefore, he has given you an assignment to carry out. Watch it therefore, he has given you a duty to concentrate on. Watch it therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh at evening, or at midnight, or at cock crowing, or in the morning, in verse 36, it says, let's come in suddenly. Since we don't know the time, we don't know the hour, we don't know the date, it says when it comes, it comes suddenly. He finds you sleeping. Verse 37, it says, and what I say unto you, my disciples, I say unto all, watch. The Lord is telling us here, number one, where they work, we have an assignment, and we need to have consecration for his, 
eternally profitable work. Come back to that verse 34 of Mark chapter 13. It says, for the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey. That's a far journey. After he spoke to them, after he was crucified, after he died, after he rose again, he appeared unto them. Forty days with many fallible proofs. They knew that this is the Christ. It's the risen Christ. It's the redeeming Christ. And it's the Christ who will come again. After that, he went away to heaven. And now he's been in heaven. As heaven is far from the earth, so as he taken a far journey. And he left his house. Who left his house and he gave authority. He gave assignment to his servants and to every man his work. He said, this is what I've been doing. If I were here, now I'm going on a far journey and I give this assignment to you. I give this work to you. He gave to every man his work and he commanded the porter to watch. What work has he given us? Going to all the world? And preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth in him shall be saved, and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. What work has he given us? He says, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. He has given every man his work. That's why in the early church, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. It is your assignment. It is your duty. He has given every man his work. And we need to have the same consecration that Jesus Christ had when he was doing the work. Look at John chapter 4 verse 34. John chapter 4 verse 34. Jesus says unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And to finish his work. Remember, he has given every man, every believer, every child of God, every son, every daughter, every minister, every servant of God, his work. And Jesus had this consecration uh, that he will do the will of him that sent him until he finished his work. In fact, it says in John chapter 9, uh, verse 4. John chapter 9, verse 4. I must work the works of him that sent me. That was his consecration. And that must be your consecration. My consecration now, we must not allow any other sin to take the place of the work of God in our hands. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. That's the attitude of Paul the Apostle. And that should be your attitude. That's the attitude of all the apostles of the Lord, of all the disciples of the Lord. At that time, they committed themselves and they consecrated themselves to do what the Lord has commanded them to do. Let me show you a verse or two in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, reading from verse 24. Acts of the Apostles, we're reading from chapter 20, and we're reading from verse 24. It tells us in verse 24, it says, But none of these things moved me. He could have said, Whatever is taking place, pestilence, or pandemic, or disease, or an agent of Satan to buffet him, or thorn in the flesh, or whatever in the community. He could have said, all this persecution, all this suffering, all these afflictions, all these attacks, they don't bother me at all. That's consecration. When you don't allow anything, anything you see, anything you feel, anything you hear, anything taking place around you, when you don't allow any of those things to move you, and you know that he has given every man his work to do. He has given me the work to do. He has given you the work to do. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear to myself. Paul, the apostle, knew. He knew that God will protect him and God will preserve him. 
once he concentrated on the work the Lord has given him to do, once he concentrated on going to all the cities, all the places that the Lord has sent him to do the work, he knew that the Lord will preserve his life. His promises will not pass away, and his protection will not pass away. His redemption, deliverance will not pass away. Watching over him, he knew that heaven was watching over him until he will finish, until he will do everything the Lord had committed to him to do. That's why he said, they don't move me persecution. They don't move me um, adversity. They don't move me pandemic. They don't move me, but none of these things move me. Neither can I in my life dare unto myself that I might finish my cause of joy. That I might finish my cause of joy. He has committed a work into my hand. Evangelism into your hand. And edifying the church into your hand. Planting churches in your hand, growing the church in your hand, and telling your neighbor, and telling your friend, and telling everyone of the work of the Lord, of the sacrifice of Christ at Calvary. And he says, I'm going to concentrate on that. I'm going to consecrate for that until I do and finish everything he has given me to do. He says, until I, I finish my cause with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, look at this, to testify, to witness, to declare, to proclaim, to publish the gospel of the grace of God. Isn't that the same thing the Lord has given you to do? Isn't that the same thing the Lord has given every member of the church to do? That we will testify and witness and publish and proclaim and declare the gospel of the grace of God. Look at Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 6. Romans chapter 12, we're looking at verse 6. It says, having the gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. And then in verse 7, it says, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teaches on teaching. And then in verse 8, it says, or he that exhorteth on exhortation. And he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, and he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Have you noticed there? He tells us, concentrate. He tells us, consecrate. He says, be a man of focus, a woman of focus. Don't be a person that is dragged here and there, and then you cannot concentrate on the work the Lord has given you to do. Remember, he gave every man the work that he must do. And he says, we must keep on watching, watching over that ministry. That's why it says, we have different gifts and different graces. And he tells us in that verse 6, in that Romans chapter 12 verse 6, he tells us that we have differing grace and differing gifts. And if it is preaching, the proclamation of the word, concentrate on that according to your faith. If it's counseling, if it's helping people and making them to stand in the way, in the word, in the will, in the wisdom of God, Make them do that. Concentrate. Don't be a jack of all trade, a master of none. You double into this, you double into that. You want to have this other area. You want to do that. You want to do that. And yet the primary thing and the primary focus and the work of evangelism the Lord has committed into your hand, all that is not done. You want to collect, you know, titles as people are collecting flowers or they are collecting stamps and you are not concentrating. The Lord wants us to concentrate. He says, knowing that the time is at hand, knowing that Christ is coming, and knowing that the time of our living this world is nearer now than when we believe, He says, you are a preacher, 
you are a declarer of the word of God, you are a witness of the gospel, to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, it says, let us concentrate on that according to the proportion of our faith. In verse 7, it tells us, in verse 7, it says of ministry, let us wage on a ministry. Let us concentrate on a ministry. The Lord is asking you to minister the word and to minister his grace and to minister all the promises unto the people that ought to hear you, it says, let us wage on a ministry. Or ye that teachers on teaching, improve on your teaching, and deepen your teaching, and expand, extend your teaching, and let the people know that you are thinking of them, and then you present the word unto them, concentrating and consecrating on the word the Lord has given you to teach because you are honestly declaring, honestly defending, honestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints. Concentrate on that. Don't go here and there. Don't be shifted to this and be shifted to that. It says we need, need to consecrate and need to concentrate and wage on our teaching. And then he says in verse 8, in verse 8, or he that exhorted on exhortation. You're encouraging people, concentrate on that. You're exhorting people, concentrate on that. You're lifting up people, concentrate on that. You are um, helping other people to stand and to stand firm and never to compromise, concentrate on that. He that exhorted on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. And he that ruleth with diligence, and he that showeth mercy, do it with cheerfulness. So the Lord is telling us, number one, according to Mark chapter 13, verse 34, the Lord is telling us, is given every man the work to do, and let the potter watch. Now we come to the commitment will to have, for, to an effective Personal watchfulness. Mark, chapter 13, reading from verse 35. Mark, chapter 13, verse 35. Watch ye therefore. This is a commandment to everyone. And this is what we need to commit ourselves to. This is what you need to commit yourself to as a child of God, as a servant of God, as a preacher of the gospel, as Anyone in the kingdom of God that you have received this commandment from the Lord, it says, What ye therefore? For ye know not when the master of the house cometh at evening. That's not the time to be careless. I'm relaxing now, like David was relaxing, and then saw what he, he shouldn't have seen, and then followed that up, and he fell into the pit of sin. Keep on watching at evening. Keep on watching at midnight and keep on watching at cock crowing or in the morning. It calls us to watchfulness every time, everywhere, and at every crossroad. It says, keep watching. And then it tells us in verse 36, in verse 36, let's come in suddenly if you are not watching. Let's come in suddenly if find you sleeping. That's talking about spiritual sleep. That's talking about spiritual slumber. That's talking about lukewarmness. That's talking about carelessness. That's talking about not paying attention, not being at alert anymore. Let's come in suddenly and find you sleeping. It wants us to watch. And we need to commit ourselves to watching every time. In Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 42. It wants us to be ready. Watch it therefore. For ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. What hour your Lord doth come. He wants us to have effective personal watchfulness. That your watchfulness is effective and is personal. You are not saying because so and so is not watching, I too will not watch this. It's a personal decision. It's a personal direction. And it's a personal devotion unto the Lord. It tells us in Matthew chapter 25. Reading from verse 13. Matthew chapter 25, verse 13. Watch it therefore. Uh, have you noticed something? Jesus saying this over and over and over again. He wants you to be ready. 
and he doesn't want you to be forgetful. It says over and over, Watch ye therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. He emphasizes that again, that you don't know, that I don't know, that angels don't know, that nobody knows, that no author of any book knows, and no so-called prophet of this latter day knows. It says, Watch ye therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. And it tells us in Luke chapter 21, Luke chapter 21, reading from verse 36, Watch ye therefore and pray always. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And to stand before the Son of Man. It says, Watch ye therefore. Have you seen over and over watching and being watchful? We're told in First Thessalonians chapter 5, reading from verse 6. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6. It says, Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. Those who are careless, they're sleeping. Those who are lukewarm, they're sleeping. Those who are running after the world and they are not thinking about the coming of the Lord, they are sleeping. And those who are buried in the things of the world and they throw away the assignment the Lord has given to every believer, they are sleeping. It says, therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Let us watch and be sober. Look at First Peter chapter 4, verse 7. First Peter chapter 4, reading here from verse 7, it says, But the end of all things is at hand. The end of all things is very near, is close at the door. What's going to be a response or reaction to that? When it says, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Uh, that, that's, the, that's the response of a person who knows that the Lord is coming. And he knows that the Lord can come at any time. He needs to be watchful. And he needs to commit himself to watching every time in an effective, personal manner. Revelation chapter 16, reading from verse 15. Revelation chapter 16, reading from verse 15. Behold, I come. As a thief, that means I'll come suddenly. That means I'll come unannounced. That means I'll come when people are not aware, when people are likely to be sleeping. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keepeth his garment, lest he walk naked and the sea is shame. Blessed is he that keepeth his garment, his garment of righteousness. His garment of holiness, his garment that the Lord gave him at the point of redemption, at the point of being born again. He doesn't neglect that garment and allow the garment to be eaten by termites of temptation, by termites of evil deeds. He does not allow the garment to be eaten or to be soiled or to be defiled by any action at all. Blessed is he, his personal. Blessed is he, is in your hand. Blessed is he, you need to have this personal watchfulness. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Now, who are the people that are to watch? Is this for only the preachers? Is this for only the workers? Is this for only the apostles? Who are the people to watch? We'll come back to Mark chapter 13, reading from verse 37. Mark chapter 13, reading from verse 37. It says, And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. It says, You are my direct disciples, Peter, James, John, Andrew and the rest of them, I say this to you, watch, and what I say to you, my immediate disciples and apostles, I say unto the rest of the body 
unto the rest of the disciples. Watch. He said, what I say unto you of, at the church of the first century, those are the believers, what I say to them, I'm saying to all the church, I'm saying to all the people, I'm saying to all the children of God in all succeeding generations. And in this generation, watch what I say unto you. I say unto all, watch what I say unto the ministers of the church. I say to the ministers of the church, watch. I say to my servants, watch. And what I say unto the ministers, I say unto the members. What I say unto the servants, I say unto my sons and daughters. I say unto everyone, what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. What I say unto the people that have any challenge, and they so that the challenge will not sweep them off their feet, so the challenge will not make them to collapse and to compromise what I say unto them. I say unto other people that are not having any peculiar challenge now, don't let easy time or hard time, don't let difficult time or delightful time sway you off and shake you from your ground and make you to compromise what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Look at Luke chapter 12. It's telling every one of us we need to watch. The Lord is coming. And because the Lord is coming, we don't know the hour. We don't know the time. He wants every one of us to watch. It says in chapter 12 of Luke, verse 35, let your loins be guarded about. Tighten your belt and don't allow any part of your life to be flabby or to be careless or to be compromising. It says, let your loins be gathered about and your lights burning. And then in verse 36, in verse 36, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord. Act like you are waiting for his coming. Behave like you are waiting for his coming. And behave like the coming is coming maybe today or tomorrow. And you don't know when it will be. Because of that, you are like unto the men waiting for their Lord, and you are all ears and all eyes, and you are watching and you are listening when the trumpet will sound, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh, when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. They may open to him immediately. And look at verse 37 there. It says in verse 37, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. You see, there's no time and there's no chance to be careless. There are some people that say, once you are saved, you are forever saved, whether you are watching or you are not watching. Those are the people that contradict Christ. They contradict the Savior. The, Jesus said, watch, but they say they don't have to watch. They are saved and forever saved. But Jesus said, blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet, and he will come forth and serve them. Verse 38, in verse 38 it says, And if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so blessed are those servants. Uh, the Jews divided the night to uh, four parts uh, from six to nine, first watch, nine to twelve, second watch, and twelve to three, third watch, and the three to six in the morning, uh, the fourth watch. And it says, anytime they will come in the night, whether well, first watch, second watch, or third watch, or fourth watch, anytime, he find them so doing. Blessed are those servants that will keep watching. I pray the blessedness of those who are watching the Lord will fulfill your life in Jesus' name. I said the Lord will fulfill your life in Jesus' name. Keep on watching. It's coming. And I pray you will not be left behind when it comes in Jesus' name. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, reading from verse 7. So, 
that she come behind in no gift. He was talking to the Corinthian believers. They had the gifts of the Spirit. But some of them were rejoicing because of that gift of the Spirit they had. And they were forgetting what they ought to remember. Look at this. You come behind in no gift. But this essential thing, uh, waiting uh, for the coming uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever gifts you have, uh, keep waiting uh, for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever opportunities you have, keep waiting uh, for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever blessings and experiences you have, and whatever testimonies you can give, uh, keep waiting for the coming uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever you are passing through, and whatever may be happening around you, keep waiting for the coming uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. It tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, reading from verse 10, waiting for the coming of the Lord, waiting, waiting for the coming of the Lord, and to wait for his son from heaven. It says, that's what you are doing. You say, I'm expecting the Lord. I, he has saved me. He has sanctified me. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm in the service of the Lord. I know the work he has given me to do. He has committed to the hand of every man the work they must do. And I am doing that. But while I'm doing that, I'm now to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Keep on waiting. Don't allow anything to shift your attention and to shift your focus and to shift your concentration from that watching for the Lord. It says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 5, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 5, is saying, and the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God, look at this, and into the patient waiting for Christ. You know, everywhere we are being told in the scriptures is coming. Every time, everywhere in the scriptures we are being told, watch what is coming. And every time he's saying, as we watch, wait, 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 and wait patiently, and act, and live, and behave like someone waiting for the coming of the Lord. It tells us in James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. James chapter 5. Verses 7 and 8. Be patient, therefore. Are you going through any trial? Be patient, therefore. Are you going through some persecution? Be patient, therefore. Are you expecting something that has not come? Uh, and your mind is, is in a hurry. And you want to throw away your faith and throw away your confidence in God. Just because you have not gone a thing, uh, be patient, therefore. He that shall come will come. Your prayer will be answered. God will settle everything. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming uh, of the law. You see that? All the writers, all the authors led by the Spirit, taught by the Spirit, and guided by the Spirit, they encourage the believers, they encourage the saints, they encourage all the children of God, and they're saying, be patient unto the coming of the Lord. The Lord is coming, definitely. He said, you will come, and he said, heaven and I shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And he says, he that endures to the end, temptation comes, endures trial comes and deal difficulties come and deal persecution comes and deal it says see that endures to the end the same shall be saved and all the apostles are warning us and all the all the apostles are exhorting us and they're encouraging us by the spirit of God and I say be patient calm down and be peaceful calm down and don't allow anything that may be happening to jolt you or to destabilize you be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord, until, until the coming of the Lord. Behold, the Osman man waited for the precious fruit of the earth, and has long patience for it, until he received the early and the latter rain. The early rain of the Holy Ghost and the latter rain of the Holy Ghost power in feeling coming upon us. He wants us to receive that and he wants us to be uh, members of the church that are filled, that are 
that are indwelt by the Spirit of God, and then He wants us to do everything He has called us to do. He shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea, and to the and in Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. And while we're doing what He has called us to do, while we're doing what He has commissioned us to do, while we're doing what He has empowered us to do, then the Lord will come. And great will be our joy, and great will be our reward as well. It says in James chapter 5, verse 8, James chapter 5, verse 8, Be ye also patient, be ye also patient, establish your hearts, be established in the Lord. Don't be here and there, and don't be blown by all the winds and the wild winds of, you know, circumstances happening today. Be ye also patient, and establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth near. If you've gone through this study with us and you've looked at all the verses in Mark and all those verses were referred to in Isaiah, in Daniel, in Joel, in Zechariah, we come to the New Testament, we've read from Matthew and Luke and we've read from Acts of the Apostles and we've read from First Peter, from all those epistles, even to the point of revelation. And he's saying there is no doubt in your heart the Lord is coming again. Now he tells us not only that he's coming, the coming of the Lord draws near. As the coming of the Lord draws near, he wants you to watch. He wants you to be ready. And he wants you to be looking for that time when you will come. He wants you to be saved and make sure you are saved. He wants you to be sanctified and make sure that you are keeping the purity of heart. Because blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see the Lord. He wants us to be so committed unto the Lord. He has forged our heart. We're looking for the appearing, the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. When the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ and then it will take us to heaven. The rapture will take place, number one. After that, the great tribulation, number two. And then after that, there will be the sign of the appearing of the Son of Man as it comes in the clouds. I believe you'll be ready. You are going to be watching. Why don't you rise up now and say, Lord, I thank you for what I've learned today. I thank you for the revelation of your word. It's very clear to me that I need to watch. We have learned today the saints' watchfulness and readiness for Christ's coming. Saints' watchfulness and readiness for Christ's coming. You tell the Lord, tell the Lord, you know, what will it be? If you are still in the world at the time when there will be the shaking and the shattering of all the stars and the moon and the sun, and when the stars begin to fall, when there will be earthquakes in diverse places, volcanoes taking place, and the sea roaring, and people are panicking, they don't know where they are going to run to, you must not be here at that time. Pray that the Lord, when he comes at the rapture, the Lord, when he comes to take the saints away, the Lord, when he comes to take his people away, you will be ready. You will be ready. Because as the Lord has said, so it is. And so it shall be. That there will be the shaking of everything shakeable. The earth and the sky and the heavens. And then the sight of the Son of Man. The people in the world at that time, they will see the Son of Man appearing in of the clouds in great power and great glory. But then we will be coming with the Lord at that time. You see, at the time of the rapture, he comes for the saints. And you'll be ready. You'll be, you'll be available. And you will be ready at that time to go with the Lord. They will be with the Lord. And when he's coming after the great tribulation, the saints will come with him. As he comes in the clouds. And at that time, you remain and you abide in the will of God, in the word of God. You know that when he comes, you will be available. When he comes, you will stand at that time before him. And you must understand that he will, he says he will send his angels to the four corners, south, east, and north and west. He'll send his angels all over and he'll gather the elects. These words are the words of Christ and the words are sure. 
and the words are certain and he wants you to be ready for your own part that is the part of the church which is the rapture you are not waiting until all those constellations are shaking you are not waiting until all those events are taking place you want to be ready at the time when you will come for the saints and take them away oh lord make me ready Oh, Lord, get me ready. Anything you need to readjust in your life, oh, Lord, make me ready. Any habit you need to break out of your life, oh, Lord, make me ready. Any correction you need to make about your way of life, your style of living, oh, Lord, make me ready. Any apology you need to make to the people that are seriously offended by you, and you know it, and they speak in your conscience, oh, Lord, make me ready. Anything you need to do to make sure you settle everything, and there's no weight, and there's no load on your heart, oh, Lord, make me ready. You want to be ready. You don't want a little thing. You don't want a major thing. You don't want anything that will not allow you to be ready at the time when he comes. Tell the Lord, Lord, make me ready. And then tell the Lord, Lord, the wisdom you have shared already and the wisdom you have given me already to learn a parable of the fig tree. When you see all these things happening, and know that the time is certain and he is at the door. You want to tell the Lord, oh Lord, I'll not be careless. Oh Lord, I'll not be lukewarm. You'll be vigilant. He said, learn. You must learn. He said, learn. You must learn. A parable of the fig tree. When you see the leaves, it's talking about when you see the children of Israel, they've come back now as a nation and they are taking root as a nation. And then all the other things that he said will be happening from the beginning of sorrows to the climactic things that will be happening. When you see those things happening, wake up and say, Lord, I know you are coming so that life will not just go on as usual, so that life will not just be lived carelessly as we have always done and he says remember that his word will be fulfilled heaven and earth shall pass away but my word shall not pass away and whatever the date setters are telling you and whatever messages they are sending to you on your phone and they are telling you the date they know the date is coming and they say this will end at this time this will end at that time and they are giving specific days to specific events you know those are the presumptions deceivers and those are the people they know what Christ said no man knows and no angel knows take your stand take your stand don't be a person that is so curious what did they say what did they say to, you know about the date what is coming don't be presumptuous yourself give yourself fully wholly entirely unto the Lord and keep to the word of God. Remain with the word of God. And then tell the Lord, keep me watching. Tell the Lord, keep me watching. I'll keep on watching. I'll not allow anything to sway me or to take me up. And don't, don't allow your watchfulness to be diminished. Keep on watching in a steadfast way all through your life. And with the same consecration of the Lord Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ, if he were here, he said, I will do the work. He says, my meat is to do the work and to finish the work the Father has given me to do. He said, I must work. I must work. You too must have that must, and you must have that compulsion upon your life to concentrate on what the Lord has given you to do. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. Are you a teacher? Wait on your teaching. Are you a preacher? Wait on your preaching. Are you a pastor? Wait on your pastoring, on your shepherding. Are you a giver? Wait on your giving and concentrate and multiply and increase in what the Lord has given you to do. The Lord is coming. Be committed to his coming and be committed to your personal effective watchfulness and tell the Lord that when he will come, everyone's purposeful waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, and I'll keep on waiting for the trumpet of the sound. The Lord is coming, and the Lord is coming for you, coming for me at the rapture. Don't wait until he has taken the saints away, and then you wake up suddenly, knowing that he has come, the rapture has taken place, and the great tribulation has now started, 
I pray you'll not be here at that time in Jesus' name. You're saved. Keep that salvation. Sanctified. Keep that sanctification. Make it real. Make it real. Not just sanctification in the head. Sanctification and purity of heart. Cleansing and purging of the blood of the Lamb. And living the sanctified life every time. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we well, thank you at this time and we we'll bless your name. Thank you for what you have learned today. Thank you for what you have exposed us to. We we'll pray, Lord, the center of this teaching is that you will keep us watching. And we we'll pray that everyone will, will keep watching and will keep waiting for the coming of the Lord, which is imminent in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, all carelessness, all lukewarmness, all sleeping, spiritual sleeping and slumber, you take away from every one of us in Jesus' name. We pray that when that day comes, which nobody knows, which no man knows, which no preacher knows, when that day comes, that you come for your people, every one of us will be waiting, watching, ready in Jesus' name. We pray that all the grace we need, all the strength we need, all the love we need, all the obedience we need, all the grace and all the virtues we need grant to every one of us in Jesus name that Lord when Christ will come when uh, all temptations, persecutions, all trials, everything will be over and then the Lord will say it is time come over. I pray Lord every one of us will be ready and none of us will regret that we didn't watch, we didn't wait, we are not ready. Every one of us will be waiting, watching, will be ready in Jesus' name. We thank you Lord because we know you have answered the work you have committed into our hands. Help us to concentrate on that and to keep on doing that, never slowing down and never looking back and never uh, shifting to another thing, uh, but concentrate Concentrating on the work you have given us to do, and great will be the reward of every faithful son, daughter, and servant of the Lord on that final day. We thank you and bless your name because we know you have done it. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.